Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Tomas Hubel. Welcome, Thomas. Hello, Rick. Good to meet you. I saw you at Sand in 2011. I saw you give a talk, Science and, uh, non Science and Non Duality Conference. Right. Uh, let me read a short bio. Uh, Thomas was born in Vienna in 1971 as a 26 year old medical student who was also very interested in body work and related therapies. He felt a strong inner calling. He took the radical step of following this inner wish, abandoning his studies, you were a medical student, and uh, spending the next four years in retreat in the Czech Republic. During this time, he did almost nothing except meditate and explore the spaces of inner consciousness. Looking back on this time, Thomas speaks of a fundamental opening that took place. After returning to Vienna, he started offering one-to-one -one sessions. His ability to touch people very deeply and encourage them to take a look beyond what they usually see soon led to invitations to lead larger workshops. His popularity then grew further, and he became known internationally. Since 2004, Tomas has been active worldwide, organizing talks, workshops, trainings, to tonings, and larger events such as the popular Celebrate Life Festival, or his healing events which have brought together thousands of Germans with many Israelis to acknowledge, face, and heal the cultural shadow left by the Holocaust. When he's not traveling, he lives in Berlin and Tel Aviv together with his partner, the Israeli artist Yehudit Sasportas. Hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Good. Um, so my first question is about your um, your four years in seclusion or silence. Um, did did you have a formal teacher before that who instructed you to do such a thing, or did you just were you completely on your own and just felt the, the call to do that and went into that seclusion? I mean, basically, I I had. Um I didn't have a formal teacher. I looked at different teachings in the time before I went to Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. And I think one influence that was pretty strong was uh, Ken Wilber. Mm -hmm. Like I read Ken Wil Ken's books and uh, it is like a archive of knowledge basically. So through Ken's books I got to know many other things. and. Um, I think some names that deeply inspired me were uh, definitely Ramana Maharshi, Sri Aurobindo, uh, Ken himself, mm -hmm. and um, and then I had a very strong inner guidance at this time. So I really, it was like as if I had my teacher in inside, and there was a very clear instruction that I somehow got um, how to go step by step and explore inner spaces. And um, so that was a very powerful time for me. And I think whenever somebody asked me, hey, what are you doing? Because it was very disturbing for my family. And, you know, uh, it's, and I said, I don't know, but I feel that I am in a, in a kind of a training, studying, in a different studying time. Mm. And it, uh, I didn't know where it's going. And it was also risky because I really loved studying medicine. But uh, something, somehow this was stronger. It's interesting. I think sometimes when you hear about people following inner guidance, they, it's just kind of moodiness and and just whims that they follow, and, and it doesn't necessarily lead them anywhere. But I get the sense that in your case that it was le very legitimate, obviously, and um, you know, really compelling. And, and you weren't just fooling around. There was a there was a sort of a definite um, burning direction that you took. Right, right, and and I think the guidance that I had then is also what the teachings that come through now mm -hmm. is is a similar place, and um, so I it was truly a, a deep, deep direction that was in this guidance. There was a direction, and there, now when I look back, I can see how one step built the other, and built the other, and built the other. So there, there was definitely something deeper. Uh, emerging in myself. What do you make of that guidance? Do you, do you feel like um, there's an actual sort of that we're somehow guided by higher beings? You know, some people talk of um, guides that that sort of direct the course of our lives, or do you feel that it's just to, we're tapping into a deeper, more intuitive level of our own innate intelligence? Or you know, our own intelligence obviously is not just individual; it's it's cosmic intelligence. We're just tuning into that. Um, or, you know, how did did you give some thought to you know what it was that was actually guiding you? I think it's uh, it's 
it's for different people in different levels of their development, different things. So it's not always the same. So mm. some people speak of inner guidance. This is when they, what I would call, when they develop through their soul level, and and they, and then there are kind of other beings that we like identify the guidance with. But if you go higher than that, then then the guidance more and more comes from what I would call the source or the divine intelligence itself. It's more and more direct until you break through in, in a kind of a non-dual realization where actually you're walking and the guidance becomes not two. And then it's it's not a something else or something other or another being or something like this. It's it's a it's a deep coherence with the cosmic order, I would mm. say, that, that we call guidance. Mm. It's beautifully put. Um, and during that four years, did you have someone helping you out, bringing you food and stuff, or were you still going out to the store and doing basic things like that, but just spending most of your time meditating? Yes, I was with my first wife at this time, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we were in a countryside house of her family that we spent a lot of time. And of course, I did also other things. I went also out to nature, and I went for shopping, and of course, I did these things. And and this was not. I wasn't sitting four years, seven days a week in the, uh, twelve hours of meditation. But there was a very. There were many days of many hours of meditation, mm -hmm. definitely. And uh, and it was not always easy. Also because I had a bit of an inner struggle also with my studies and with my path because I love healing and I love medicine and I love science. Mm -hmm. And um, so I needed to go through a process myself. And um, But finally it led to what it led to. So at times you were wondering, what am I doing? You know, I left medical school. I'm sitting here with my eyes closed. <laughs> yeah, Was this a, such a smart thing to do? <clears throat> right. There were doubts also, but there was something stronger that, that was like pushing from much deeper in my being. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. There's so many, uh, you know, myths and fables about people overcoming doubts in order to pursue the thing that which they feel, you know, they have to pursue. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, in every culture you hear stories like that. Right. <clears throat> And what was the fundamental opening? Can you describe the fundamental opening that uh, that finally took place? Yeah, the the closest I can say about it is that it's something fundamentally changed, like in 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 my perception of reality or how I was viewing reality. Something fundamentally changed. That after that, it was not anymore the same, like Thomas and the world and all this kind of setup, this construction in myself so suddenly fell apart and uh, and there yeah there was a like suddenly the screen much clearer or it's very hard to describe in words but it was a very profound change in in my whole way of being or my whole way of being in the world like me and the world something fundamentally changed and um, and I think afterwards I, I was still for one year after that experience like sitting many hours and uh, just in a flat in Vienna and I, I some people came to me for for kind of guidance or sessions but but eventually I was still sitting uh, a lot in silence afterwards mm -hmm. you yeah. use the word suddenly several times so it was it really a sudden thing so one day you woke up and all of a sudden something changed Yes, it happened in, at a certain point in a meditation. Mm. And there were some other experiences before that in these four years, of course, but that was kind of the most fundamental change that I experienced. Mm. And you, you know the story of Ramana Maharshi where he had this fundamental shift and then he spent many years just sitting in, in silence in, in caves. Is, is that sort of what you were doing in Vienna? I mean, was there a, a sort of a need to deepen or stabilize or integrate or something that caused you to be, continue to sit in, in, in meditation? Right. There was like, yeah, there was a, it's this deep wish. It's like as if you like to, like as if you're breathing and you love fresh air. Mm -hmm. It's like sitting when you love the silence and there is not really something missing. And then you just sit because it's simply delightful and delicious and, and, and like deep. And so it was, there wasn't much that 
attracted me out of this state of sitting or being in silence and being on my own or so but what I felt then already was that there is something that that will come and I and that will when the times ripe I always knew there will be a different phase that I will need to go out with this at a certain point in time and that life will somehow pick me so that this was for sure part of it mm. again the intuition <clears throat> so it was right. like a, it was like a preparatory phase that you were right yeah right right <coughs> and uh you mentioned that was your previous wife was your wife a little bit unhappy with all this sitting in silence i mean it <laughs> seems like it might not have yes it it was also it was a, also a kind of a pressure on the relationship because of course she wanted to explore the world and she wanted to you know have other experiences as well and for me this was a deep uh, pull and especially afterwards when I, I started, because my life then suddenly changed and from one day to another I started traveling and I, you know, I was on the road all the time. Yeah. And, the, and so from being together many hours, uh, like many days, all the time, so we suddenly our life changed. Mm. And I think from a certain point in time we also knew that that's not going to continue. And I get the sense that... Um there too, when you began traveling and all, it was the intuitive pull that was rather compelling, and there just really was no choice. You just sort of had to follow that that impulse. Yeah, it was also that another spiritual teacher came to town. His name was Paul Lowe, and um, and so when when he when he saw me in his workshop, he actually also opened the gates because what he said about me and my energy was simply that suddenly people started to invite me for workshops mm -hmm. and um, and then I just followed from this day on I just followed this movement and it just continued and it grew and you know now it's I think 10 years later and or even more and many many things have happened since then mm. it's an interesting thing and it's a familiar pattern actually my my teacher was Marshi Mahesh Yogi for very many years and he uh, he had spent 13 years with his teacher and then after his teacher died he spent a couple of years in silence up in the Himalayas and then he just felt this impulse I gotta go to South India he didn't know why and, fi and everybody thought he was crazy for wanting to leave there but he, he followed the impulse went to do it and people started inviting him and next thing he knew he was getting right. you know plane tickets to go to the west and <laughs> One right. thing, one thing, just led to the next. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. And I deeply believe that also that's how it works. If things are ripe, they are somehow effortless. It's not that you, you know, need to invest so much or somehow then they just open. And that, and I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. You just feel the impulse, cooperate with the impulse. Right. I suppose there are some people who fight against the impulse i don't know what happens to them but um you know maybe it's just a struggle or maybe maybe nature gives up and says all right this guy's not going to cooperate let him keep doing what he wants to do but it's good that you followed it <clears throat> right um so nowadays do you still find that you're inclined to spend time in silence because it's so sweet the way it was during that first year after the shift or do you find that's unnecessary now because whether you're sitting in silence or eyes open you know in activity it's all the same thing yeah i think now my meditation shifted a lot because i'm i'm uh you know i'm teaching a lot i'm i'm giving a lot of groups also quite big groups mm -hmm. and and i work a lot with individuals and so every time because my work um, is very much based on, okay, there are some some more general uh, things that we can teach that are like that that apply to most of us, and then my work is also very specific, so that I give very specific feedback to to people's individual path, intelligence, state of consciousness. So and this attunement with people, so so really go deeply into their source code in a way mm -hmm. is is uh, a very deep meditation for me so when i give groups i am in a deep deep meditative state all the time mm. and um so i think that's just shifted and because i do it nearly every day all the time so it's something that's continue it continues and it's much more in movement than it was then in this right. time so this was more the silent part and now it's 
it's the meditation in action in a way. Yeah. And when you're dealing with groups or individuals and you you know you're you're saying various things to them, um, is it in any way based upon what they're saying to you, or is it more of a non-verbal um, perception or intuition of what needs to be said, and it just kind of, you, you, in other words, you could hardly say have much conversation at all with an individual, and yet you know what to say to them or what to do to facilitate. Right. It's. I think it's all of that. It's. It's some. Uh, often people come to me with questions around their life, around their spiritual practice, around whatever their evolution, mm -hmm. and um, and I'm like a lot of. Inf the more open somebody is to really hear something, because not always when somebody asks a question, there is an openness to receive a feedback. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's energy and heart is really open, and there and there is a kind of a readiness. Then a lot of information comes to me, and then mm -hmm. I think then I I really it's like as if the gates are open, the water is just pouring in, and yeah. as long as the gates open, the water is flowing, and once the gates close, the water stops, because I believe that the universe is very efficient, and it the, this hi higher intelligence doesn't waste uh, energy, mm -hmm. so if something is not ready to be said, it doesn't even come to me. So sometimes people ask me questions and I have nothing to say. And sometimes someone asks a question and there are loads, loads of information that is coming. Good. Well, hopefully during this interview it will be the second thing. <laughs> 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 it's actually a, a principle in physics. They say the principle of least action. You can throw a ball and there are a million different courses that the ball can take, but it's actually going to take the one that's most efficient, you know, because that's the way nature functions. Right. I deeply believe that's that's how it works. Yeah. Mm. So I was gonna a after having asked you about your you know your own personal journey and unfolding, which I've already done. I was gonna ask you to kind of just give us the overview of your teaching, if you had to summarize it in five minutes, and then we'll, we can go into more specifics. So we've started to go into your teaching a little bit. Why don't you give us uh, an overview of what it is you you teach or say or do with people? I think we pay, uh, my work is based on different pillars, I would say. So one part is that I believe that um, also on the spiritual path, we, we definitely need to look at our individual development and we need to look at our shadows. We need to look at, okay, which parts of our intelligence are in action and in movement and which parts of our intelligence are blocked. And so we, this is one pillar. We look at the, the, how much of your intelligence is currently active because the suffering comes from everything that's held back and not active mm -hmm. so we we look okay what can come online more for you, for you or anybody to have the richest and fullest experience of this lifetime available so that's one part the other part is um that we teach some like we developed a tool over the last 10 years it's called transparent communication because I say, um, if we deepen our awareness and our spiritual practice, more and more information is available to us. So every human being radiates basically the whole information to his or her life, every moment into space. And if I am uh, present enough, like not consumed by myself so much, and if I am uh, tuned in enough, so we can literally join each other's river of intelligence and have a much deeper understanding of each other's perspectives. Mm -hmm. So this leads by the time to a deeper unification of, of separate perspectives as a cultural tool. So as something that a group, even a big group, can practice and it will actually align people into higher presence and higher alignment with, with the energy that's currently happening. Mm -hmm. So that's also one part, and we developed loads of exercises how to open this part in ourselves, because I believe that's a, an ability that we have available, that's one ability of spiritual intelligence and emotional intelligence, and if we open that, so we have a much deeper understanding of each other, less conflicts, more, more potential-oriented culture, so that we support each other's potential, and by that the culture will make a jump. And so that's one aspect as well. The other aspect is that I, in the last years, start talking much more about mystical principles. So because I believe that there are some universal principles that um, 
life and existence is based upon. And if we know this, these principles, so we can align with them, and this means much less suffering in life and more flow and a deeper understanding. If we work against those principles, we're actually more stuck, more in resistance, and we will have more suffering in our experience. So that's definitely a part. Then one part is like the transcendence part, the stillness, the meditative breakthrough into, into unformed consciousness. So that's certainly one part. And one part is what we call service. So how does my, my development serve a greater context and a, a greater environment than just my own spiritual journey? So that it doesn't stay my meditation and my practice, but that, it, that the radius of my influence through this will grow. Mm. And so we, we see, okay, how can we create... For example, our three-year training programs have all, everybody does a project that serves something in the world, and so we we are looking that the spiritual practice always has also an aspect of service for the greater good. So okay. that are ma the main pillars, I would say, of the work. Great. Now, if we may, uh, let's retrace those and go into some more details and specifics and concrete examples. Um, so you can reiterate them better than I can. So the first one had to do with it, kind of individual focus, and, um, and right. ple please explain it again. Let's get into more specifics. So the shadow integration, like the the, I'm saying, every one of us is born with a specific intelligence, a composition of intelligence. Part of this intelligence can develop itself in the given context and part of this intelligence is like dormant for many people like and some people let's say have easier circumstances so they are fuller they are more incarnated more grounded they got the much more support for who they are so their intelligence could develop itself easily other people uh, had more difficulties more traumatizing environments and so on and so they might not fully be able to express what the, the gift that they got, and so we are we are looking to we develop this tool of transparent communication, which means that we are doing a lot of communication or dyads or triad work, and we go we learn to read each other much more precisely, so that we that we perceive, um, let's say, the sources of the symptoms that we have in our life. Because most of the time in the groups when somebody asks a question, the question is a symptom. And, and so my job or the job of people who are learning this work is to find out what's the source in, in this being's experience that causes this symptom to arise. For example, that I have constantly troubles with my rela intimate relationships, that I have constantly trouble with money, that I don't know what to do in my life. That I so there are, these are symptoms on the surface. And if we, if we look in the mystical teachings, uh, especially also the Jewish Kabbalah teachings, so we find that there are different levels of information, and the deeper our level of consciousness is grounded in, in, uh, in the source, the more information is available for us. So we are, our speech, our actions, and our life basically is much more coherent with this cosmic flow, and then, and therefore, when we open our mouth, we say something that hits the point. Mm -hmm. So the higher is our consciousness development, the more my speech and my actions need to be aligned with this deeper flow of life. And therefore, I'm less and less talking about life, but I'm actually talking more and more from the present moment, from the intelligence of the present moment, and not from a reflection of this present moment. So it, life becomes more direct. And, and that's a very powerful tool. Therefore, also, I think a lot of therapists, coaches, people who work with people come to our groups because they find this very helpful for their own practice to this, this addition that we, we teach to the normal psychological uh, knowledge that's anyway already very popular. And so that, that's a very powerful uh, mechanism how to integrate shadow aspects and get them more online. And actually, someone from our three-year training program 
developed now, he's uh, the head of a university in Berlin, and they developed a campaign um, that transforms hundred schools in Germany from knowledge-based education to potential-based education. Mm. So how can we as teachers and human beings and as a culture really uh, support each other in our potential development? And um, so some parts are also based upon these principles. And I think that's something that we need to evolve into as a culture on a, on a we level in our uh, spiritual development. So in other words, in those schools, they wouldn't just be concerned with filling the container of knowledge. They'd be concerned with expanding the container of knowledge, you Right, could, you could say. You yeah. Um, so in what you were just saying, it seems to me that there's a cart and horse kind of question or maybe a description, prescription question, which is that, you know, some people would say, well, just develop consciousness and then, you know, all else should be added unto thee, that all, you know, all these various shadow things will resolve and, ha you know, hang-ups will kind of clear out and so on. Others would say, well, work on the shadow stuff and then your consciousness will ex develop. Um, so which comes first? You know, which is the chicken and which is the egg here? None <laughs> comes first. None okay. comes first. Simultaneous? If we understand that the deep mystical mastery is is the mastery of stillness and the mastery of movement mm -hmm. to get as not to. I think people who have a strong uh, tendency to stillness sometimes um, miss out on the fact that the intelligence of life, the face of the divine that is, is developing, moving and expressing itself is equally important as the stillness. Mm -hmm. And that non-duality for me means that we master stillness and movement equally as not two. Mm -hmm. And this means that I, that both is actually true, both is equally important, and there is, um, the, like if I, if I'm deeply grounded in the unformed isness of, of the, the, the eternal timeless isness or ecatolicals is space consciousness or whatever, there are many names for that. And at the same time, I'm like a laser in, in a very precise moment-to-moment um, -moment speech, action, and, and way of living, so that I'm, I'm evolution and I'm ever-present. And I think this, this kind of either-or is a sign that there is not a full uh, non-dual realization. Because I th other, otherwise, there wouldn't be an either or. This, for me, that's not an either or. They are equally non dual. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your own development, there was a sequence. Uh, you went through a phase, firstly, where you were very inner directed and silent and not doing much. And then on that foundation, you came out into activity and began doing a lot. So I'm wondering if in your own teaching and working with people, you. Um, prescribe that sort of sequence where, where firstly there's a kind of a, a focus on inner directedness and then on that foundation they have they go forth and get more involved in outer things no no we we, we train this uh, simultaneously okay so we, we Alter alternately or equally completely simultaneously it's not yeah. like close your eyes go deep then come out act it it's more like completely simultaneous yeah, it's like that, for example, in our three-year training programs in the first year, people do a lot of shadow integration. This releases a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. The energy can becomes new creativity. It boosts our worldly life in a way because many things start to clear up parts of our life that are like hanging for many years, difficulties in relationship, difficulties with finding one's vocation or whatever. So that that the areas of our lives that constantly pull energy out, you know, where, where it seems like a stuck CD that is, has a recurrent pattern. So we, we learn how to more, with, with a higher competency, to really clear up these parts of our lives, because I think that's a competency. Mm -hmm. to, that's not just something that happens, but it's something that w once we know the deeper mechanics of energy, all these things are like a science. Awakening is like a, a science, an inner science, and once I understand the principles, I see, oh, that's why this is healing, that's why, you know, there are, 
and th this is what I think is something that needs to come. It's what I call spiritual competency. That that's not just a random happening. It's a random happening if I don't see the source that, that originates or that causes the movement. But in the moment I see the cause of the movement, whatever the movement is, a personal movement, a collective movement, or a very transcendental movement, I, it's part of a, a kind of a hierarchy, an inner hierarchy, and a natural hierarchy of, of creation. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of knowledge around how to, how to, you know, precisely relate to different levels and not to create a mess between those levels. And what I see in the spiritual field quite often is that people use, for example, an argument from a very um, high level of transcendence and pull it down into their personal experience and mm -hmm. cover their individual shadows with it. And this is not, not healthy. And this also keeps our spiritual development stuck. So the more we can put things into an order, uh, it's, I think it creates not only it, it creates a competency, but it also makes the spiritual mystical knowledge actually we can reintroduce it again into the marketplace also to very scientific grounded people and say listen um, you know this is not just an, an airy cloud that we call spirituality no no but it's something very grounded and if I know how to use it it can actually be very beneficial for every area in life I really like that um, I can see your old uh, medical student mind coming through in this in this kind of thing you know you're a scientist right. a scientist at heart and uh you you're kind of approaching this in a scientific systematic way which i think it can be because i think ultimately all this spirituality stuff is it's experiential which is what science is all about and you you're developing and evolving all sorts of practices which are like ways of um testing hypotheses and and arriving at experiential conclusions uh, right. And I, th I think that's great. And regarding levels, um, you know, I'm always getting flack from people because I'm always talking about levels and, and very much in the context of what you just said, which is that people sort of misapply levels very often. They, right. inter they interpose them. They take something which is valid on one level and then right. they, they try to apply it on another level and it doesn't make sense. Like, right. for instance, saying the world is an illusion. Okay, fine, on some level the world is an illusion. But, you know, on the level of stepping in front of a bus, the world is not an illusion. And you have to obey right. those laws of nature on the level at which they operate. Right. I think, I think actually, I mean, it's very important what you said right now, because I think actually this saying is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. To say that the world is an illusion is very dangerous, because it can lead to the fact that if you, I mean, if you, if, if this is the separate experience of the world is an illusion, but not the world is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very difficult saying. And in some, I think in some levels of development, if somebody is really truly before, as a, before a very strong realization, like a, a, a master or a teacher might use this as an intervention in order to, you know, uh, flip the coin in a way, but uh, I think to tell this to the majority of people as as this is how it is, and I think that's very difficult because I think if the world's an illusion, all the participation in the world, in the in the expression of the divine aspect, is actually in vain because it's anyway an illusion. Right. So all the all the aspects of my humanities that I my deepest humanity becomes my highest possibility this, uh, this means deep vulnerability compassion love clarity and so on that these values we only express if if you really care about the world and I think that's a pathology that I see arising in 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 some of the satsang um, non-dual fields that there is an overemphasis on stillness and a lack of competency in the movement. And then people that are not in the state that Ramana Maharshi was in are using Ramana Maharshi's uh, teachings but are not in the transmission and therefore it's not true. And that's, I think, a very important part to look at because I think it can keep people very passive and um, not really relate to the evolutionary aspect of life. And then we say, oh, there is no evolution because evolution is an illusion. And I think that's simply dangerous to say. 
Beautiful. I feel like clapping right now. <laughs> it's a, you've stated very, very eloquently something which is a recurrent theme in these interviews because I feel very strongly about what you're saying. Um, in Sanskrit, there's the term mithya, which means dependent reality, and they use the example of a pot. You know, and really the pot's only clay. Fine, there's no pot. But on the level of the pot, which is dependent on clay, you have a pot. You can put water in it or beans or whatever. You know, so, and you can't deny that the pot exists and can function as a pot. So, you know, even though, again, in the same breath, you can say, well, it's really only clay. Yeah, fine, but it's still a pot. So, you know, this kind of paradoxical... Uh, both and uh, situation is the way life is structured right and I think in the moment because the world is being born moment to moment out of uh, consciousness so when something arises from nothing something needs to fulfill itself in order to return into nothing that's the Zen cycle that's what's also written in the Tao the King mm -hmm. so the Tao gives birth to the world and to the thousand forms and then there is written, express yourself completely, then keep quiet. And so, if energy, we are all already born, so we, we, we are already movement. And so, the, it's n we are not anymore asking the question, if we want to be born, because we are already here and we are exploring the movement and the stillness. Mm -hmm. So, now we need to live our life completely in order to return into nothing, to release the energy and leave without the trace. That's how the saints are called in the Kabbalah tradition, the ones that live without the trace, mm -hmm. which means the ones that fulfill the energy completely and return into silence. And if this is my moment-to-moment -moment life, and if this is the fulfillment of my incarnation, so then I can express myself completely and return into nothing as nothing. And this sounds to me much more appealing than to say the world's an illusion. The world's yeah. equally divine as stillness is divine. There's a T.S. Eliot poem, Burnt Norton, where he talks about, we will never, I can, I can only paraphrase, we'll, there, will nev there will not be an end to all our seeking until we come back to the place from which we started and then discover it for the first time. Right. And, and yeah, and there's a there's another Sanskrit phrase which I don't know the Sanskrit, but the English is the contact with Brahman is infinite joy, but you can't have that contact with Brahman until there has become a contactor, uh, you know, someone a living, breathing entity who can retrace the steps back to the source, and then as a living, breathing entity live the source in in the in the world and that stirs up a, a joy a bliss which couldn't exist with just a flat on manifest had it never had it never manifested right and the fact is there is a manifest world already and therefore it's it's not a question we are not there is not just silence and i think there's a misunderstanding of non-duality that that the the emptiness is the truest realization and I think that's, that's not fully complete. That's not a complete realization. The full awareness of the process of creation, how we are here now having this conversation, and how out of nothing the universe is being born that holds this planet in which we are sitting and through the internet, we are part of an evolutionary movement and we are really enjoying it because it's, it, this is the ecstasy of the divine that creates this. Mm. And so, I think that flow and movement and the masculine and the feminine realization, they are equally important. And, and otherwise we wouldn't have this, this conversation here. Yeah, <laughs> it would just be a flat nothingness. You know, that, yeah. you know that Sanskrit phrase, purnamada, purnamidam, this is full, that is full. So it's not just the one unmanifest absolute fullness, the relative manifest is also full, and the two fullnesses together make kind of a whole that's more than the sum of its parts. Right. Right. Yeah. And then we can be deeply grounded in the silence of this moment and the presence of this moment and the unformed timelessness and eternal beingness. And at the same time, there is this incredible intelligence unfolding and both is equally true. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very appealing because then what we do in life really matters. It's not that it doesn't matter. Every word that we say has an effect. Every action that we do has an effect. And that that when we when we act out of alignment with our deepest authenticity so it has an effect and if i and then i really care about you i care about the world i care about the global crisis because it's important and at the same time i know that 
the deepest stillness of that which ever or that which always is just here is also true mm -hmm. and I think that's um, for me this this is a much uh, more appealing um, version of non-duality yeah and there are a number of teachers who you know were primarily concerned with sort of the inner world who are kind of getting more and more involved in a in the in improving the outer for instance Llewellyn Von Lee just uh, edited a book um, called spiritual ecology I just about finished reading it in which all these great speakers are writing essays about you know who are very familiar with non-dual awareness but who are writing about the uh, the soul of the world and how that has to awaken in order for the ecological crisis to be resolved and they were concerned about that that issue or like last year at the sand conference David Loy uh, and Llewellyn got up and gave a talk about um, spirituality and and global warming and then then David had this interaction with Francis Lucille in which he was you know saying well what about global warming what about the climate issue and, and Francis was saying doesn't interest me it doesn't concern me the world is like a speck of dust and that went on for quite a while and got rather testy until it finally shifted the subject but it's it does seem that a lot of people who have you know been primarily concerned with non-duality inner development just on focus on the unmanifest have turned it around and begun to engage uh, which is great because many of the people who have been engaging on these relative issues such as climate change or political change and so on haven't had the unmanifest uh, connection right. and they tend to get burned out and frustrated or angry or violent and all that stuff so it wasn't a, it wasn't complete right and you're, you're saying it beautifully that that activism is something else because activism comes from a limited perspective mm -hmm. but the true action out of alignment of caring and deeper flow of intelligence um, is actually what in the in the Jewish tradition is is called um, like in the Jewish tradition people talk about the tikkun and it means kind of a like a spiritual um, opening that can take place it's like a correction of our mm -hmm. flow so when our karmas uh, actually freeze our intelligence into a certain quality, um, we can open it and release it, and that it can unfold its into its highest potential. And and this quality is also something that we can apply on collective issues. And can every time something is out of alignment, um, there is there is a kind of a correction for it. And so I think a deeper caring about the global context is, is definitely important. And if it comes from this deeper inner connection, then it's not just activism. Then it's realigning with some cosmic flows and orders. Mm -hmm. And that's very powerful. Yeah, and if it doesn't have that deeper connection, then one is just, it's just palliative. One is just messing with symptoms without getting to the underlying cause. Right. And there's a beautiful sentence for... Uh, that is a hard nut for some people that says the, in the Tao of the King it says the, the world's sacred it doesn't need to be improved hmm. and that's a beautiful sentence but it also means that the world has evolution as well inside there is development part of the world but my limited perspective cannot be the one that judges if the world needs to be improved because often we want to improve the world that it's more comfortable for us and that's definitely a whole other department mm. but what I'm saying is from a deep inner connection there is a deep caring for the manifest world as well which means which is equal to the let's say greater feminine enlightened principle that the mother will never leave her children which mm. means the the force of creation will always care for creation as well hmm. and not just for emptiness and so then we have both aspects the true emptiness and the fullness of life equally important and then we have a kind of a caring and action in the world and for the world that comes from this deeper place of knowing 
Yeah, look what's been done to the world in the name of improving it, you know. I mean, pay, right. par- pay paradise, put up a parking lot, as Joni Mitchell sang. <laughs> right. uh, and, uh, and obviously so, so many ramifications of that. I mean, the people who are drilling for oil in the Arctic, now that the Arctic is melting, probably think they're improving the world. Yeah, we need the energy. You know, it makes our lives better. It improves our world. Right. But it's uh, obviously not true. Right. <clears throat> um, there was something interesting you said in one of the, talks I was listening to where it reminded me of, I guess I could summarize it to say, uh, conditioning reinforces boundaries. Or we might say, routine work kills the genius in man. In other words, you know, to when we experience, we naturally have to focus uh, in very specific ways. But that focus ha- kind of habituates us to narrowness. And and uh, so, what would be the antidote to that, so as to maintain comprehensive awareness while while focusing as we must do? Yeah, both again to practice the deep, deep beyond, mm-hmm. which is freedom, and to also practice that we that I believe everything that is in life. Everything that is an energy, an object, a thought, a mind, a, a culture, a society, is pure movement. And and the lower we go in the ladder, the more concrete and structured the universe becomes. The higher we go in the ladder, the more energetic, the more uh, potential uh, reality becomes. And we have many different potential realities available, and one is forming itself right now. And so that um, that if I know that my inherent nature in creation is actually movement, then I will look that I can bring as many parts of my life into the highest movement that's possible. And one practical example, for example, that our I believe that the nature of our learning and our mind in our brain is that we create habits from everything. And that's very good because you don't need to learn to walk to the computer every day to make these interviews so you know how to walk. So that's a good habit to have. But the other thing is um, when we are in a long-term relationship, in an intimate relationship, we create a habit from our, of our partner in our own awareness and what we see when we relate to our partner is not our partner but the image of the partner in myself. And that's actually a problem because it means that it freezes my experience of my partner and I don't push the refresh button every time so I see the old website every day. And that's a problem. So what we do now as a practice is to say, listen, the more awake you are, the less you know people. Which means every time I see you, so today I see you for the first time so I get a fresh impression of you. When I see you, after a hundred times, I say, oh, it's Rick. But that's actually that I'm asleep. In the moment I say, oh, it's you, I'm asleep. Because I'm not tuning in and, and being with you exactly how you arise right now in this moment. And so that's where when I, to overcome this conditioning that we, or this conditioned reality that happens in my own perspective, is, is a very drastic and very fundamental spiritual practice. So every time to see life again fresh, and even if my mind knows you, I'm still looking again, who are you right now? Who are you right now? Who are you right now? And this, this is a very deep spiritual practice, because what I say in, in, um, in the teachings often is that there are two different spiritual paths. One is the monastic part, so I, I go out of life, I retreat, and I have a very intense deep spiritual practice in a monastic life or in a cave in the Himalayan mountains. And the other one is that I practice in culture, but if I practice in culture, I need to learn to live according to the laws of culture. Otherwise, I will constantly have troubles in my life. And we see many spiritual practitioners that are actually very ungrounded, that have difficulties uh, with earning money, difficulties with getting their life done, with their relationships, even with their children. So there, there are some things that are definitely not in place sometimes. And it, it looks like that um, it's a more spiritual life, but sometimes it's just a more ungrounded life. As you said, sometimes people follow their intuition. They say, oh, I'm in the moment, but they are not able to keep a commitment. And that's not what being in the moment uh, necessarily means. 
And so if I if um if we practice in culture, we actually need to practice in all four directions. So we need to ground ourselves, we need to transcend ourselves, and we need to have a horizontal impact in culture and an awareness of a higher or wider radius of of, of life. And and that's a very demanding practice. And so if we if we mix the monastic life with the culture as a spiritual practice, we might get in deep, serious trouble because it might be that our suffering will be actually increased. And that's, I think, um, wh where we need to be careful when we import spiritual practices from the East, where we have more monastic or more retreat versions of spirituality. And But here, in culture, we need to live fully because everything that's not moving fully is actually creating um, suffering. Mm -hmm. And so every time I release the movement and I participate more, I participate more in the creative aspect of the universe, and this sparks my genius ability to be more online. Mm -hmm. and, and then innovation is actually not, or creativity is something that is an ability. It's not a coincidence. It's not that I have creative moments. It's actually that creativity and innovation is something that I can learn and practice. And once my channel is open, I'm moment to moment innovative. You know, I, I'm, I'm literally becoming an innovative movement. And that's what the genius is. So, you know, you mentioned being able to balance freedom with focus and you know this has been an elaboration on that theme um, you know I think most people are deficient in the in the freedom aspect um, you know people have through decades of focus or, or you know living through the through the five senses uh, have become very bound and individuated and they they Many people don't even realize there is a, a dimension of freedom to be found, uh, but those who do realize that still might not find it so readily. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about how you can kind of create the proper balance between freedom and focus, if we want to use those two words. And also with regard to conditioning, um, I mean, obviously you don't work, wake up in the morning and say, who is this woman in my bed? There's, there's a kind of a knowledge and a, a, a detailed knowledge of the person, and yet you're saying that, that there's a, the, a certain aspect of conditioning which is undesirable and which which um, limits the relationship or limits the experience right. and the same could be applied to you know a violin player a, a, a commercial airline pilot whatever the, those those skills demand a great deal of knowledge and experience and training and conditioning and yet at the same time um, we don't want to lose our freedom uh, in the narrow boundaries that the conditioning tends to uh, reinforce. Um, so go ahead and, and respond to that if you would. Yeah, so uh, I mean I, I definitely agree with everything that you said. Is It's not that we don't know who is this person and at the same time in the moment I know who is this person mm -hmm. I there is a high tendency to fall asleep in the memory of this person. So that what I said before in the transparent communication we train that we actually attune ourselves again and again and again to, to the moment that is happening so when I talk with you I need to be attuned with you and at the same time I'm open space mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm presence and how is it that you're able to be open space well uh, you know, was that through uh, those four years in silence that that got established primarily Right. I think it came through also my meditation practice before, but it got uh, gradually deeper. And it and I think in in after these four years, there was a deep shift in 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 consciousness. So that that's that's a home. Mm -hmm. And and at the same time, the precision in everything that's arising in this home is is continuously also growing and developing. And yeah, so it's it's both. 
And so how about the people you work with? Because you're not advising them to go off and take four years of silence. Um, and I don't even know if you're advising them to sit in you know, an hour of silence every day or, or whatever. How, how do you enable them to culture the kind of freedom that you enjoy? Yes, we do, we do some uh, deep meditation retreats, though, okay. uh, which means that everybody who comes to me and says, I seriously want to study, so they, everybody needs to do a, quite a, an intense med, as a meditation practice and spiritual practice, mm -hmm. and which includes the body awareness, an inner awareness, a shadow integration, a meditative awareness, different kinds of meditations, actually, uh, to open different parts of our being. And, um, for example, in our three-year training program, we go for 18 days to the Himalayas, oh, and we nice. have very, very intense meditation retreat, which mm -hmm. is a 24-hour meditation. We call it the cave, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a very deep process that has a strong transmission, and uh, many hours of meditation. Also, people sit in through the nights, and um, it's, a, it's a very specific composition of, of, of parts of my work, but... Um, so we and we have this regular for deeper students, so students that are long-term students. So we they have a very uh, intense me so spiritual practice, and so it gradually grows. And I think if one day I see someone in in my group and I think it's time, then I would send them also off for one year to a meditation retreat. Mm. Um, so definitely, I, I see this as a very important part. Okay, good. Good. That makes that kind of puts another piece in the puzzle for me. Um, right. So now I, I don't know if we've covered it, but um, earlier when I asked you to summarize your teaching, you you gave like three separate things. There was the individual thing, then there was the kind of the more group dynamics thing. And have we really discussed that adequately yet? Yes. So w what I say is that there are certain uh, principles, and I believe many people who come to groups are also people who who have a high degree of spiritual intelligence available to themselves, intuitive intelligence and uh, also emotional intelligence. And, and these are aspects that in our current education system are not so promoted, let's say, are not so de developed actually. And so I believe that there are some abilities of our spiritual intelligence. If we just support them a bit, they start flowering. Mm -hmm. and, and this can become a collective or cultural ability and so we are working also on a on a kind of a we aspect of of awakening so how does the we awaken to higher levels of itself and what does that mean and um yeah so that the that the, the the increasing radius of awareness also creates a more awake culture mm -hmm. and i'm also very interested in What's the impact? So we have research circles on consciousness and business. We had a research circle on consciousness education. I told you what was one aspect and, uh, and health. And so we are also looking how the consciousness development really affects different important systems of our society so that it also makes a difference in the world. And there the we aspect comes in. And then the other aspect that we said before is uh, mystical principles. So for example, one mystical principle is, I believe, that when out of uh, nothing, something's arising, this, this energy needs to express itself completely in order to return into peace or nothing. And, and many aspects of our lives are actually based upon this. This is true for every thought. This is true for every emotion. This is true for for every incarnation, for every lifetime. This is true for bigger cosmic cir uh, circles. And, and this is also true, for example, for the nature of a shadow and the nature of a recurrent pattern in my experience. And so we are looking how to deepen our awareness so that we see the principles of creation more clearly in everyday life, in every interaction, in, in, in systems like a company or in, in, in different nature cycles. And then we suddenly understand on a deeper, more fundamental level what actually are the forces that compose my current existence and even my current perception of reality. And that's something very powerful. And then suddenly we see, for example, that even parts of the tradition, like in Christianity or in, in Judaism or Islam, that many modern people, so to speak, uh, you know, expelled from their life, 
um, held or are holding very precious principles that are not anymore so much filled with energy, but if we see the mystical aspect of it, then it, they are very beautiful principles and that ha they have been around for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so we are not just reinventing the wheel, but uh, we just uh, bring in the mystical aspect of some things that became empty rituals and suddenly see, wow, there was there's a lot of wisdom all around us all the time. Mm. That's great. Um, I mean, obviously, if, if intelligence or consciousness is the foundation of everything, and, and not only the foundation, if, is, if it permeates everything, if it's really the ocean in which we all swim, then uh, nothing is sort of dumb and, and, and routine and, and mechanical merely. Everything is imbued with intelligence. And so you, I, I guess what I hear you saying is that you're kind of seeking to understand and awaken that intelligence in all of, in all of its various expressions, um, sort of remove the cloud of, of dullness that, that shrouds intelligence in business or in education or in relationships or whatever field which have kind of gotten numbed by... Uh, routine, repetitiveness, constant attention on gross levels of life to the exclusion of the subtle. Right, the mm. exclusion of the subtle and even the ignorance to the unformed and mm. that when we awaken this again and we see, wow, there are so many, um, so there's so much beauty in, in, in words like confession, what is a sin, what is a marriage, what is, what was the foundation of this, uh, all these terms and, and, and by the you know, centuries, things got lost on the way. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I believe deeply that in the mystical, in the traditions, it doesn't matter if it's Buddhism, if it's Judaism and so on, that they're, you know, the, the ones that really knew or know what they are talking about are just a few. These are the true mystics. Mm -hmm. And then, and I think if you, if we get contact to these true mystics, in whatever tradition, there is such a beauty that's unfolding, and and I think therefore, even hundred years ago, hundreds of years ago, when there was no mass transportation, people were traveling half around the planet to suddenly meet someone like that, because the answers that came out of this kind of deep groundedness in consciousness is they were very different than all the other answers that you can get from limited perspectives, mm. and so I believe that that this quality needs to be like the in the in the Western world, we are missing a bit like the the, the the mystical competency, and and I think that's something beautiful to go for, and to reintroduce this as a as a very valid part besides science and besides other things that this needs to have its place in our society because it has an important role. Has a critical role. It seems to me that everything is so messed up because it's lacking because that mystical right dimension is lacking right, you know, right, right I mean we can sometimes people think that uh, a kind of an enlightened society would be we, we would return back to a simple life where we're all farming and wearing loincloths or something <laughs> but yeah. you know really we can still have you know sophisticated technologies and, and everything else but uh, just uh, infused with with the we could call it the mystical or spiritual dimension which kind of brings everything into proper alignment so it's no longer you know s um, Inflicting so much harm on us. In fact, it could be to everything could be totally benign and yet, and and technologically sophisticated. Right. And if we look into evolution and we see that life forms tend to grow into higher complexities, so it would be. I think it would be stupid to think that that uh, an enlightened society would just return to farming. Maybe sure. some people would because this is their vocation, but uh, other people would be totally thrilled with complexity and with, uh, you know, with the genius expression of of, of human excellence, mm -hmm. and and. And therefore, even therefore, I think it's so crucial that we that we create a different form of contemporary mystical understanding that is able to to relate to genetic engineering, that is able to relate to nanotechnology and to all the amazing parts that are out there. And we are creating moment by moment right now, but to and also to see that it's very important to see different levels of development and not judge them just by their pathology. To always see what is the amazing contribution that capitalism, that modernity, that the industrial age gave to humanity 
and and what are the shadow aspects and to learn to look at this more differentiated and um, and then see okay we, we correct the pathologies and the shadows but we definitely want to continue with the amazing contributions and then then we somehow also you know finish with this um, with this kind of myth that uh, enlightenment and uh, intellectual knowledge are not going hand in hand so either you you don't think and then you're enlightened but then you think you're not enlightened this is I think this a very strange notion that kind of is reminiscent of uh, Ken Wilber's pre-trans fallacy you know right yeah that that enlightened people are going to be like little babies sort of innocent right. and not thinking <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah. Now you mentioned genetic engineering, and which that brings out an interesting point related to what you're saying, which is that, you know, taking that as an example, and there are many other examples, at the present time, that's a pretty scary thing, actually, because, you know, the th w people are like, the, the people who are doing genetic engineering really don't have a very comprehensive understanding of what they're doing. It's, they're, they're kind of uh, messing around with a level of nature's functioning, which they, they only very partially understand, and making changes at that level, which could be devastating in their consequences. And I don't know whether genetic engineering ultimately has any right to exist, but if it does, it'll have to be in a way that uh, we're completely cooperating with the intelligence of nature rather than, than kind of applying limited human intelligence to something that only the intelligence of nature really comprehends, you know what I mean? Right, and I think you're totally on. I think it's, it's, it's also like um, funny to think that genetic engineering has no right to exist because it has a right to exist because it can bring a lot of positive things but potentially said, potentially but but if it's driven by money if it's driven by uh, ego limited motivations so then it's a problem because then then we actually apply things sometimes too early we we don't have a full deep understanding and alignment as you said with the natural intelligence of life and but if if the enlightenment aspect and I think that's that's a, a crucial answer for our time is actually that the deep scientific revelations and the mystical revelations need to work together that there is no other way that the deep inner knowledge and the deep outer knowledge they need to find a fusion and they need to find a, a much deeper dialogue and then to see how much they can um, uh, benefit from each other and that that if you bring in the deep alignment of the mystical um, realization into science and that's actually the inner connection to the scientific uh, revelations and so it's much more connected to the growing evolutionary intelligence and then we will use these technologies wisely and if we use them wisely they can be a huge benefit if you just look what modern medicine contributed to to how much suffering was eliminated through this it's incredible and therefore sometimes when when people come to my groups and usually also many people come that come out of alternative uh, medicine cycles and I'm very appreciative of all kinds of healing uh, technologies that work and and I'm working a lot with healing myself but the to exclude one or the other is simply stupid because there's all the flower is important and we need to know when to use what and I think that's what you said if, if genetic engineering will be used wisely it can be a huge benefit for life and if it's used egoistically like just for benefit and profit and um, money of companies so then it's actually it can be a huge trouble that we ah. create for ourselves yeah I mean taking medicine as a case in point look at uh, antibiotics, how, how 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 wonderful those have been, and yet now I live in Iowa, and they give antibiotics to all the pigs and the cows, and you know, so they can produce more milk without getting infections, and so the pigs can live in these crowded little containers without you know so getting, cool. and so all, all that's kind of getting into the water supply and and you know into the meat and it's getting to the point where not very many antibiotics work anymore uh, and then all these super bugs are developing so you know and it all comes down to greed really and, and short sightedness um, right yeah and that's the pathology and we need to correct the pathology without dismissing the original invention and seeing all the millions of people that benefited from these antibiotics mm -hmm. and so if if we if we 
if we keep this, that every level of development will create a shadow because once something is being born and once something creates a structure, every structure will have a shadow. And we need to learn to relate to the shadows and to correct them. And I think then we create a natural hierarchy of development that is beneficial and that is in alignment with the intelligence that runs through us. And that's a very exciting uh, tool to have. Yeah. So just to reiterate, and perhaps to summarize, and we can both summarize and reiterate, um, it seems that we're not going to dismantle society. You know, is all the, the structures and the technologies and the means of communication, everything else that's been built up, it's not going to all be dismantled and we're going to get back to some kind of pristine, primordial <laughs> world. Uh, but So the only solution is to infuse or supplement uh, all th these structures that have been built with divine intelligence with cosmic intelligence or whatever and and we human beings are the instruments through which that can happen we need to awaken that in ourselves and then through us enough of us have doing that things will naturally kind of fall into place and and all these technologies that are at this point so askew and so so harmful in many ways will perhaps you know become totally benign. They'll serve their uh, ideal intended purpose, yet without the unwanted side effects. Right, and, and to see that life is try and error. And I think uh, Sir Ken Robinson puts it very beautifully on his, uh, he's a, uh, like a speaker, a very popular speaker on education, mm -hmm. and he puts it very beautifully. He says, look, most of the people when they come out from, uh, from our educational system, they are totally afraid to get things wrong. And, and therefore, we cannot be any more truly genuine and creative. And so that that we see, yes, life is also learning. And I think if we are if we are living our life in that high integrity, that when we see we we actually make a mistake, that we correct it. Mm -hmm. So then we can totally experiment and and also really be pioneers in in the excellence of human intelligence because. I, I, I don't believe into this myth that we will all come back and, and be farmers and, and have no technology. I think it's also stupid because there are, there are so many other things that will build upon the technology that we developed until now. And we just need like a deeper inner development and a deeper inner connection and that more and more people will actually have a breakthrough into this deeper awakening and from that be fueled in whatever their excellence is and that we again um, dare to really allow and support human intelligence and excellence in, in all the 360 degrees of, of um, flavors so that we are not just saying intelligence and we mean intellectual cognitive intelligence there are so many other parts of human intelligences that are necessary to create a sustainable culture and and if it's deeply grounded in the unformed, more and in more and more people, and we really dare to live up to our highest potential, I think then we we have this life that that many people are looking for. Yeah, I think it was Thoreau who said, uh, "Go ahead and build your castles in the air. That's where they belong. Just put foundations under them." <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Now, you're doing some real interesting work, and I mentioned it in the introduction, um, in trying to heal the shadow of the Holocaust and, uh, you know, working with Germans and Israelis. And um, you, you yourself are Austrian. You're married to an Israeli. Um, let's talk about that a little bit, if we may. Um, do you feel like the Holocaust still casts a pretty dark shadow? And uh, let's talk about collective consciousness and the evolution uh, and the evolution of collective consciousness and so on right i think yes i mean my work started out of germany and then mainly in germany in the first years and what i have seen is that uh, in in many groups i have seen actually the same pattern happening so that when we come to a certain intensity and depth then there was an eruption and really literally like 30, 40 people out of 100 started crying and seeing horrible images in one moment. It was like a fire through the group. Mm. And, and so that, that once we allow a deeper sensitivity, vulnerability, openness, and, and, and space, so the, the valves are open, like the pressure in the collective consciousness is looking for 
for ways how to discharge itself. Mm. And, and this we see in pathological forms and sometimes in people that are uh, becoming psychotic. But it's also, uh, we, we see it in, in, um, in, in groups when spiritual practitioners open their inner world more, so suddenly this energy can come to the surface, which is actually a very he healthy process. It's a kind of an inner hygiene process. And, and so I thought, wow, I saw this again and again and again, especially in the training programs. And then I said, listen, we, I think we, we need to develop tools how to take care of collective shadows. And the Holocaust shadow is one, but there are many more in, in, on this planet, uh, through atrocities that have happened all over. And are still Just, happening. Yeah, and they're still happening. And so if we understand an individual shadow and how one trauma can create a, a deep impact in, in a person's life later on. So then we understand that the collective trauma can, can create a deep impact. And so now we have two possibilities. Either generations after generations will actually live through the symptoms of these traumas until they are so diluted that they disappear. Or we, we do some very precise consciousness work and the collective shadow needs collective caring, which means Big groups of people, like thousands of people, come together and taking care of this collective unconscious energy that's just looking for, for a kind of a conscious awareness in order to appear, to integrate itself, and then to become free energy or creativity. Mm -hmm. And so we developed some tools how to do that with large groups. And, and I did some big events and we are still also doing this big uh, Celebrate Life Festival in the summer. And so we are looking how to uh, use part of our spiritual practice also to take care of our collective life base. And, um, and I'm living currently also in Israel, um, so I see the other side of it in Israel. And now we are creating um, workshops and, and projects how to to work with this energy because it's a very strong um, impact or scar in the collective consciousness. And I also believe that now there's a lot of, you know, writing about the European Union and about the financial crisis in the European Union. And I think, yes, that's true. And if we want to unify Europe, we also will need to take care of the collective unconscious layers that have been between the countries in Europe, so many things have happened here that in history that are crazy. Mm. Um, and if, if we put it together, this collective unconscious material will show up as financial crisis, political crisis, social crisis. So it will find symptoms how it expresses itself, but actually deeper in our collective psyche, we have something to take care of. And, um, and I think if we are, by, because on a collective level, we need to express a, a global consciousness. Without the global consciousness, we are not able to um, to deal with the collective, uh, let's say, problems or collective stuff that we are dealing with, like global warming, for example, and there are others. And um, and I think we are we need to like in the in the mystical knowledge, we're always talking about free energy which is um, free possibility or intelligence and structure. And the tension, the creative tension between the structure that has a gravity and the free energy that constantly pulls evolution to new heights is called evolutionary tension. And if this tension is healthy, a human being develops and stays grounded and inspired. If we are too much in the energy, there's a lot of inspiration, but not so much happening in one's life. And if the structure is too strong, we are, we are very much in life, but we are stuck in it because we are not developing really. Mm -hmm. And so we need a healthy balance. And, um, and I think that's, and when we, when we open in the, in the expression of life, our energy to higher levels of consciousness, like Aurobindo describes. So we need also to create a proper vessel for it. Otherwise, we cannot handle the intensity. Mm -hmm. And what I see humanity going uh, through is we need to create a global vessel that much more intelligence can flow on a global level and deal with the topics that we need to deal with. And, and on the way there, we need to give up on, or we need to transcend, not give up, but transcend uh, national identities, national interests in order to create a global caring. 
And um, on the way there, we will need to deal with our collective shadows. Interesting. So a couple of questions. One is, um, do you feel that a relatively small group of people, maybe thousands but still a fraction of the total population, can serve as a sort of washing machine to um, heal the collective shadow for the benefit of the entire population? Right. It, 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 of course, there is a correlation to the intensity. For example, a few thousand people are not enough in Germany because the, the, what, hap what happened here was so so out of alignment that so extreme um, yeah so extreme that we we would need really like stadiums f full of people to really if you if you really want to create a massive uh impact but uh actually even a group of thousand people can create a difference and if we do it more often and if we really uh, work ourselves through this energy, so I think we can clear up quite a lot um, w w with this size of groups. Yeah, it would also depend on the potency of the group, which would depend on the, the potency of the individuals in that group. I mean, theoretically, a group of a hundred could do it if the you know if, if it were powerful enough. Theoretically, right? <laughs> if you have hundred masters that that really yeah. know what they're doing, yes. <laughs> right, right, um, and uh, this thing about. Uh, you know, I'm letting dogs in and out here. Um, <laughs> the uh, I mean, obviously we have our own thing in the U.S. with uh, you know slavery, and it was kind of a big deal that we elected a black president. Um, and of course there was a backlash to that. There, there's a lot of uh, opposition and resistance and all that he's been getting, which people won't acknowledge. But I think it's largely because he's black, and it really pushes people's buttons. Um, so and. And I mean, these these days now, there's the Arab Spring, and Egypt is in the headlines. There's a huge thing happening there. I mean, when you look at these situations, like for instance Egypt, um, with your knowledge of the deeper mechanics of life and the collective shadow and so on, do you uh, do you read more meaning into it than the average person would? Do you sort of see the? Do you kind of get the symbolism or the significance of various events that are taking place? No, I definitely think that something very fundamental is happening at the moment on the planet and that the Arab Spring is part of it, that simply some structures in consciousness that are not anymore serving um, the, the, the evolutionary development of life, they are breaking open. And uh, like the financial crisis in, in some Western countries is part of it, is, is also the Arab Spring by itself is actually just a sign that things crack open and that but it's not an easy transition so the the problem is that many people are really suffering and that there are many casualties and also when you look to syria uh, i mean it's it's incredibly it's incredible what's happening there mm -hmm. but on a on a more collective level i think i think if you see it from a higher perspective like in also in time like that human evolution simply takes is we are looking at this in in a span of 70 years but if you if you look at this um on a on a much longer timeline i think that's just some deep movements in the human consciousness to break open structures that are too old mm -hmm. and to open them into a fresh uh, to let the the wind in and and leonard cohen uh, sings a very lovely line that says the cracks where the light comes in and and either there is a, a voluntary development, which means when we are aligned inside, so we are actually developing before we need a crisis. But if we don't do that, if we are too fixed in the conditioning, in the structure, so we need something that breaks open the structure for life to develop, which is in itself a very healthy movement. Art, for example, good art, is our cracks in society. Mm. So, and we need these cracks for our sanity. This is what keeps us sane. And um, and I think what happens in the Arab Spring right now is that there are cracks, and new movements want to want to happen. In itself, it's a good movement, but it's it's uh, like many people are suffering from the way how it's it's happening. Yeah. 
back in the early 80s or late 70s, I was I participated in groups where we went to trouble spots in the world. Like I spent three months in Iran, and we just meditated for hours and hours a day in a hotel with a few hundred guys. And there were other groups in you know Central America and other places where there were trouble spots. In fact, there was a group in Israel, and <clears throat> the theory was that we were we were sort of softening up collective consciousness and helping to filter out a lot of this stuff because you know change was inevitable it was going to be that you know higher consciousness is dawning and the world is going to have to be restructured in order to accommodate it but the hope was that that restructuring could be uh, less uh, tumultuous, less traumatic than it might otherwise be. Um, and I, I, maybe we didn't do a very good job because uh, obviously there's, there's a lot of tumult, but it could have been worse. Um, so, right. yeah, so I guess one of the things you're trying to do with your groups and you know healing these shadow, these collective shadows, is grease the wheels to to enable the to the inevitable transition to be uh, more smooth and, and less. Um, you know, less uh, full of suffering and and right. Uh, cataclysm. Right, and I think well, what I said before, the to that more and more people will find this inner alignment and this kind of what I call uh, divine FM. Divine FM for me is like when the the non-dual um, uh, state or awareness is actually in the in the being part, as in the becoming part, has a kind of a radio station, mm -hmm. and the radio station I call Divine FM, and everybody has in in the heart like a kind of a receiver, and so the more attunement we we find in ourselves and the more authenticity, so there is a deeper inner guidance uh, that is coherent with the cosmic intelligence. And I think what we need to hope for is that more and more people will listen and live according to this inner guidance. It doesn't matter in which area of life, and, and by that uh, there will be a more smooth and voluntary development. Because I think in many people, many people know that already since, since longer time, there is um, like the evolutionary impulse knocking at the door. And 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 saying, listen, you need to move, you need to develop. Well, I don't know. The relationship is over. The job is over. The way how you live your life is over. The way how you care for your environment is over. And something new needs to happen. And I think the more we all listen to this uh, natural development that we can have, this is what what in the traditions people call a kind of when people come from the future. So when you literally are connected to this higher possibility that manifests through us. And, and you live accordingly. So then we don't need crisis or breakdowns in order to restart the system. And yeah, that's I think what we can hope for. I heard you say something like that in one of your interviews. You said great scientists and artists and people like that come from the future. And I didn't come entirely understand what you meant by that. I think that there are two different levels how to look at the future. One is that people dream of a better life because they don't like their current life. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the future. That's the imagination of, of an escape of now. Mm. So that's really unpresent. But then there are people that are so present in what they do that they become excellent. Mm -hmm. And this can be artists, this can be whatever, scientists, and, and all, in all professions, actually, uh, sports people, that when you're so present in what you're doing that you actually kind of exceed the limits of this specific human intelligence and you tap into something new, you become a pioneer. And this means that you, what I call, you reach through the ceiling of your consciousness and you collect fruits from the future and when you come back, you have fruits that people don't know. Hmm. And these are, these are insights, these are breakthroughs in science, these are breakthroughs in sport, these are breakthroughs in, 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 in art, in music, in visual art, in whatever, in films. And so suddenly you, you see, you hear this piece of music and you feel that, that it comes from a different place. Mm -hmm. Or you, you, you see this painting and it's, you know, you, you plug into a different consciousness. And I think, um, that's, but that's not the, then the future is actually your higher consciousness potential or development mm -hmm. it's not tomorrow because tomorrow can be in the same circle of consciousness like today so then tomorrow is not the future but if you develop into something in a new version of yourself tomorrow 
then you actually um, you are coming from the future. If this is so, you are grounded in in isness, and at the same time, you are allowing the future to manifest through you. I think I understand what you mean. So, so people who are on the leading edge, you know, who are the the real innovators, uh, they are kind of. Uh, they're embodying, or we could even say channeling, um, tendencies that need to manifest in order for the further evolution of whatever, right. uh, like Steve Jobs or the Beatles or wh whoever has, has really broken through cultural boundaries and, and apparently changed the world. They, they, they're, they're, they're kind of vehicles or conduits through which em emerging possibilities can be realized. Beautiful, beautifully put. Yes, wonderful. Okay. And okay. and it doesn't mean that these people are fully realized, or this doesn't mean that these people. You know, you can have a genius musician, and when when he or she goes on stage, you you're just amazed by what comes through this this music. And sometimes they're, and sometimes they're, they're amazed as much as you are. <laughs> yeah, right. They're, yeah, and and then and then they go down, and emotionally or socially, they are they are very uh, poorly developed. You right, know that right. they cannot get their life online, and maybe they they take drugs or whatever. But when they go on stage, it's 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 amazing. And so one line of development can actually be very refined, and mm -hmm. others not so much. Yeah. And therefore, I think a holistic human development is so important. And you said another thing that is very important. I think one sign of a healthy spiritual development is that you or everyone we are surprised. By what comes out of us, mm. our mouth, our actions, mm -hmm. more and more often. So if you are not surprised very often in your life by what you're doing or saying, it's something it's not working. But if your spiritual opening is getting bigger, so then the new information that comes through you, that your system is becoming more open, means that new things can come through you. So you say something and you're surprised by it. That's a really good sign. Yeah, because then it means that the that the systems, the nerve systems in life, get more open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also pertains to what we were saying half an hour ago, which is that you're not functioning out of mere conditioning; you're you're functioning out of pure intuition or you know, deeper intelligence. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, a healthy sign for a healthy development. With regard to, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about. You're working with the Holocaust shadow. Obviously, there's the, the Arab-Israeli thing um, and the Palestinians and all these deals. But um, do you see collective consciousness as being uh, various collective consciousnesses, like you have, you know, family consciousness, city consciousness, nation, national consciousness, uh, you know, regional consciousness, religious consciousness? Do you see all those things as kind of um, actual conscious entities in and of themselves in the same sense that you know we might see ourselves as an entity but really, really we're a colony of trillions of cells both human and non-human that, that make us function and yet there's a sort of a, an intelligence or a consciousness that is created through the collaboration of all those cells so with regard to collective consciousness is there like a German consciousness which is like the deva of Germany or a, a you know, collective it's like an actual entity that forms the consciousness of that country. Right. I mean, you could say whenever something creates boundaries around itself, any any structure in consciousness that creates a boundary and an identity, so the identity can be viewed as a certain consciousness, so to speak. And then when you attune yourself, uh, like when you embrace this this field with your own awareness, and and you read the energy of it, so you could say, okay, this this is a specific um, information that uh, is regarding to this uh, consciousness, and it might be a family, as you say, a state, it might be a globe or something bigger. But that's just a help to to read the specifics, and and what what we are looking for is how to transcend these boundaries and and literally create more open like a more open field awareness. So my answer is, yes, there is something like this, and it's also being co-created with the, the part of consciousness that's looking at it. So when we look at Germany, so we co-create this field by looking at it that way as well. So it's both. It's a, it's a co-creation in a way. 
Mm. And I've, uh, along lines of that, I've heard the, I've heard it said. In fact, it was my teacher Maharshi who who uh, used to always say that a national leader, let's say a president, can't really do what he wants entirely, not because just of political pressures, but because there's a collective consciousness that's co-created by all the people, all the millions of people in that country, and and that has its own karma, you know, its own destiny, which is very powerful. And, you know, as soon as the leader gets into office, despite all his plans and, and hopes and dreams, he finds himself governed by that collective consciousness. Also, yes, right. And therefore, it's so important that when, when people say and they, they complain about the corruption of, 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 of governments and, and why things are not working, but fundamentally, it comes down to the fact that Every one of us, in order to create a functional democracy, needs to be a grown-up human being. And grown-up means that we are emotionally, intellectually, emotionally, and physically grown-up. And at the same time, that we are caring, that we are participating fully in the life that we are living. And if every part of the democracy is really taking care of the so-called problems or issues that come along my path, so then I'm not waiting till the government does it, but uh, there are some things that we as, as, as human beings, as grown-up human beings, are responsible for. And I think if this breaks through fully, then, then democracy, some sort of democracy will work. But uh, so what you're saying is totally true. If, if, if there's always a correlation between the consciousness of, of the state and the leader, and this is one unit, so to speak. And therefore, I think that um, that the, the leadership of the future, or politicians of the future, are literally ones that are in it, that, that live out of this inner connection and can become a voice of the evolutionary power that drives the system. So, like a corporate leader would be someone that is attuned to the evolutionary drive of the system and can can voice it and can lead accordingly and the politician would do the same with the with the whole state and then i think the deeper intelligence in the system and not just the symptomatic intelligence of the system is driving the boat mm -hmm. and then it's more essential and then it's actually more serving beautiful i was reading something just like that last night in that book by Llewellyn von lee it was one of the essays and the person was saying that the, the kind of the tradition of wise elders you know and they're very rare these days but really we you know we need a world in which our leaders are like wise elders who are not just kind of telling people what to do but are reflecting um Pure you know, collective, reflecting divine consciousness, the intelligence of the universe, and kind of like are just representatives of that, and uh, and therefore can really lead from a cosmic perspective. Right, and I think the more the, like in the tradition, it's written: the more empty you are, mm. the more light falls through. So when there is less and less conditioned structure, then naturally, like the light falls through effortlessly. And this means that sometimes when you see uh, more awake beings, so you see from the outside they look like human beings, but from the inside they are pure light. <laughs> Why? Because it's empty and it doesn't the, the personality doesn't filter the higher light, so there's an effortless creation that's running through. Mm. And therefore they are also called the ones that leave without a trace. It means that we don't leave garbage, but that we really, um, you know, our life impacts the world and then... Uh, there is no karma that's being left, no uh, kind of karma that other that life needs to take care of in a in a way, or clear up. Do you, you said a little while ago, and maybe this is one of my final points, um, that you you alluded to a world in which we really had, had no national boundaries anymore. Is that what you meant to say? That we transcend the national boundaries. Maybe we will need them for some time still, mm -hmm. but I think we need to transcend them and and create a, a much bigger caring so mm. yes we can be Austrian Germans Americans whatever but um, but that's not so important what is more important that I'm that I'm a global at least a global citizen and that I and that my actions need to be infused and beneficial for a global system and and I think if, if I if I can embrace a global uh, system in my consciousness I'm also creating already a global vessel in myself 
And I think if more people will be able to do that, so then there is naturally a global caring which also means that the intelligence that we have already on the planet is also able to deal with the issues that are there. Mm. We just need to allow the flow. And I think the Internet, so the externalization of, of the brain, so to speak, the, the external neurons are helping a lot with this. So we need to also break down some structures that simply limit still the flow of intelligence on a global level. And the national interests actually are part of this, this kind of walls that we build that somehow limit a much global unfolding of intelligence. And if, if a global intelligence would unfold, suddenly you would see many more inventions come out that, that are actually again able to deal with the kind of um, challenges that we have. Mm. There's a Sanskrit phrase that goes, uh, Vasudev Kutumbakam, which means the world is my family. Right. And and you know how in a family, you know, you have brothers and sisters and mother and this and that, and they're all autonomous individuals. It's not like they're all one being. Uh, so, but they're they're family, you know. So there's this kind of harmony and closeness. So I, I think maybe you know, given the cultural diversity of the world, it may be a long time before we don't actually have separate nations. But th all these nations can be like brothers and sisters to one another. And you know, if there is sufficient um, foundation of, of wholeness or oneness in, in the awareness of the people. Right. And I, I think it's not about breaking down the, the borders of the countries now. It is illusionary because this cannot happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. But what, what can happen more quickly is that enough people will literally create a caring and, and an inspirational quality for the whole global context. And then I think we will be able to deal with inner and outer competencies for example, with, with facts like global warming, climate crisis, food crisis, whatever, uh, there are many topics. And, and I think we, we need this inner and outer competencies, not just one or the other. We need both in order to, to come up with something that's facing the challenges. Mm. On the same theme, I mean, if one were really in not, true non-duality, not just sort of unmanifest non-duality, then the Amazon rainforest is my lungs, you know? Right. The, the rivers right. Are, are, are my veins, and the, you know, the ocean is my blood, and, and <laughs> so on. So the, uh, you know, and you would no sooner damage those things than you would cut off your own finger. You, 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 there's a kind of a in, intimacy with everything that, that um, is naturally going to f express itself as, as a much more intelligent way of, of dealing with the world. That's beautiful and therefore I'm, I'm, I'm so much with, with you when, when we talked about the world is an illusion because the, the expression of the world is equally sacred and the stillness of the world and if, if this is true so I will, I will be grounded deeply in and as the unformed ever-present isness and at the same time, I, I will totally care for the expression of the divine. And then also everything that I say matters and everything that I do matters. And both is true. It's not either or. It's both is true. Mm -hmm. And then we find people where the wisdom and the groundedness in, in isness will express itself in, in true action and participation. And I think that's what we need, that the wisdom and that the, the mystical insight is actually flowing as a natural authentic impulse into life because if I when do we care for things if we feel intimate with them and if I, I feel intimate as the world so I will care for the world yeah exactly I think that's what Christ meant when he said something like uh, whatsoever you do unto the least of these you do unto me he didn't mean me Jesus Christ or whoever his real name was he meant you know me that the the, the the you know the oneness that that we all are you, you know you harm it har harm something in some way you're harming yourself right right and that's i think that's what it what it is yeah ask it not is. for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee <laughs> <laughs> i'm not really as literary as i sound i have a very spotty education <laughs> these, <laughs> these things come to mind <laughs> <laughs> I have a limited repertoire. <laughs> As people who listen to these interviews often enough will constantly remind me, why are you saying the same old quotes over and over again? <laughs> it's fresh. I see you today for the first <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just fooling you. <laughs> All right, great. Well, this has been a lovely talk. I, I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you, as I knew I would. Um, 
and I you know hope we can do it again in the future sometime, or maybe we'll run into each other at some conference or something. Yeah, beautiful. I, I would enjoy this as well, yes. Yeah. Let me make a few wrap-up points. Um, I've been speaking with Thomas, or I guess you say Tomas, right, officially? Uh, Tom, Thomas Hubel. Yeah. Thomas is good enough, Hubel. Um, and you know who he is by now. I don't have to reiterate, reiterate his bio. But I will be linking to his website and several different links that they've given me uh, on the page that I create for him on batgap.com, uh, where this video will be embedded. There will also be an audio version of it that you can download or you can subscribe to um, iTunes and, and get it as a podcast. Um, there on BatGap you'll also see um, both a alphabetical and a chronological list of all the interviews I've done and I do a new one each week so if you'd like to be notified of new ones there's a little um, email sign up link that you can just put in your name and email address and you'll get an email about once a week notifying you of new uh, interviews. There's also a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking on if they have the capacity. Um, enables me to keep doing this thing. And uh, although I don't do it full time, I have a day job, but I, you know, take a lot of time doing it and various expenses and so on. So I appreciate the support that people have given and continue to give. And uh, there's a discussion group there that crops up around each interview. Uh, we're currently having a few technical issues with the way that works, but we'll sort them out. And uh, so feel free to plunge in and discuss the points we've brought up during this interview. So I think that's about it. Um, thank you for listening or watching. Next week I have Foster and Kimberly Gamble who uh, created the movie called Thrive which uh, is a very interesting movie. I think you can see it on YouTube. You might even want to watch it before the interview. Um, so we'll see you next week.